Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this class on uh, church and ministry administration. I have um, started the recording of this class, so uh, people can make this available to other people. All right, so uh, welcome again. Why don't we, uh, someone just pray and we will get started in this course. Could somebody just uh, lead us in prayer, please? Thomas, would you like to pray? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this wonderful time, O oh God. You are so good. You are so wonderful, O oh God. As we step into the third year, Father, we are learning new things. Holy Spirit, we need your grace. We need your help to understand the things of God. We thank you for this wonderful time. Anoint each and every one of us to grasp the things of God, Daddy. Anoint Pastor Ashis as well. Let me understand and be connected in the Spirit and understand the things of God. We thank you, please. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, just want to introduce the course to us and we will get started today in our first lesson on this course. I've um, just put out the uh, the course outline, also the no notes for the first lecture. Let me just share that with us. So this is uh, BC310 church and ministry administration uh, this out course outline or overview has been put up in the class work section you can download it and uh, just look through it what are we going to do in this course why is why do we have this kind of a course on church and uh, ministry administration uh, we are all aware that although the ministry work is a ministry of the word and the spirit, uh, it also requires you know, good organization, administration to be able to uh, you know, have the church or the ministry, whatever we are doing, uh, so that we can be effective and have impact for the kingdom of God. So, while a lot of uh, the courses have dealt with the spiritual side, uh, teaching us important things, uh, we also felt that we would have to deal with some of the practical side of ministry in the terms of administration, organization, uh, media, technology. That will be another course that we have in the third year. Uh, and so this is one of those pra practical side uh, uh, courses that address the practical side of ministry. Right. So if we can combine the two, the spiritual and the practical, we can have much impact, great impact uh, for the kingdom of God. So what we're going to do in this course is we're going to talk about the organization and administration of the church or a ministry. Okay, uh, A lot of what I will, we will be talking about is from a church context, but uh, all of these things will apply to any Christian ministry. So even if, you're, if it's not a church, a local church type ministry, if it's a, a Christian ministry doing something specialized, maybe a youth ministry, maybe music, maybe counseling, maybe, you know, uh, taking care of uh, children or some, something different. It may, be, it may not be necessarily a local church. It could be some other form of Christian ministry. A lot of things we learn will apply uh, to all of them. Okay. Now, uh, we are going to learn from uh, others as well as share with you a lot of what we are doing here at APC Bangalore. And uh, we, are, we know that, you know, certain details may differ from place to place, you know, you know how uh, certain legal things uh, may differ from the way it is in Bangalore to another city or another part of the world. Uh, those differences will be there. But in terms of organization, administration, a lot of these lessons and learnings uh, can be used 
uh, anywhere in the world, right? So some of the things we'll cover, we'll talk about the importance of good administration, what are the objectives, uh, how do you set up that legal entity, we call it a trust, a church trust and governance, what kind of an organization structure do we need, or, or you know, what are structures that we could think about? Uh, we talk about having policies, guidelines. Uh, we talk, we'll talk about systems and processes that run to, in order to run the organization. Uh, we'll talk about managing people, working with people that is staff and human resource management. And we'll talk about creating culture, uh, so that. Um, you know, and the importance of culture and how that affects how uh, the church uh, functions. We'll talk about the finance, accounting, budgeting, legal side, and then <clears throat> running projects. You know, so the planning and the sorry, the planning, the coordination of various aspects of ministry. Talk about ministry teams, volunteer teams, and uh, the culture in the church. So workplace culture versus church culture. Uh, we'll talk about executing projects, making use of technology, and you know how we can be excellent in all of these things. So we're kind of trying to develop a full framework here, where um, uh, you know you think about these things and uh, apply it to the ministry that you are doing. Uh, it, not all of these things will come in place from day one, but uh, as you keep growing your your you know, the, what you're doing, the ministry or the local church, as you keep, as that grows, a lot of these things will be necessary. I uh, will have simple assessments along the way as we go, September, October, November, and you're familiar with the grading system already. Um, uh, I will keep giving you these uh, course notes as PDF documents as we progress. Um, there is also, there are, you know, of course, there are many books that you could look at in terms of church administration, but I would refer you to two of these books. Um, uh, they are a little expensive. Uh, you have to buy them in dollar, US dollars and on Kindle. So uh, if you're interested, you can, but I will be drawing uh, important content ideas from these books uh, along with, um, along with, things that we are sharing from our own experience here at All People's Church. So uh, if you can buy it or get get these books, it's fine. If you cannot get it, don't worry about it. Uh, I will be sharing, uh, you know, ideas from those books uh, as part of the course notes as well. So uh, don't worry about it. And many of you are familiar with our own publication, The House of God. We have some, a few chapters uh, that address administration and so on. Um, so let's talk about, you know, let's get started, first of all, by talking about the importance of good organization and good administration. You know, why? Why should a church or a Christian ministry think about having good organization and good administration, right? Uh, and we'll also look at some excuses people make. Yeah, when I say people, I mean Christian leaders, pastors, uh, those in leadership, those who are leading organi Christian organizations, some excuses that, that we commonly run into as to why people neglect you know, good administration, good organization. You know, so we'll address some of those things. Now, uh, let's look at things first from a biblical perspective and then from a practical perspective and then we will close by just addressing some of these excuses, right? So when you talk, want to think about uh, organization and administration from a biblical perspective, you know, uh, is there a biblical basis for us to emphasize, you know, good organization administration, you know, or is that only for management schools and business schools and uh, not for the church, you know, is there a basis a biblical basis to mm, talk about these things, right? And I just want to, you know, bring our attention to a few things we see in the Bible. Uh, you could probably add to this list. Uh, I'm just highlighting uh, uh, a few things here. So first of all, uh, we see in Scripture that God himself is a God of order. Uh, he's a God of design. 
he's a god of organization and creativity right so we see this in creation itself you know the way god uh, went about creation you know when you it's the first chapter of genesis uh, there is a certain order there's a se certain sequence in which god himself goes about doing things you know, on day one he did this on day two day three day four you know uh, there's a certain order in in that and in all that god created we see order we see design and we see things are very organized uh, of course, there's a lot of creative. There's this. This is creation. Therefore, it's a f tremendous expression of God's creativity. But we also see order and design and organization in everything, in all of creation. You know, and uh, that is that's what science does. Science is a study. You know, it's a study into the the creation of God and trying to understand, trying to discover. Uh, the design, the organization, and, and the amazing things God has put in there. You now, when you look at uh, you know at a, you know at a high level, you look at the the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars. Everything is very organized. You know, the Earth is ro rotating on its axis, is revolving around the sun. Uh, it's going on and on and on. Uh, uh, and uh, because of where it's positioned, because of its angle of inclination, because of its uh, uh, re revolutions, you know, we have weather conditions, we have all of these things, everything is in order, it's not chaotic. You know? So it tells us that God himself is a God of order, design, organization, creativity. And, uh, you know, let's read that First Corinthians 14, verse 33. We'll read a few scriptures. Uh, I will only reference these passages as we go along. Um, but could somebody read for us First Corinthians 14 and verse 33? Please. For God, for God is not the author of the confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. <clears throat> So Paul, uh, of course, this you know, uh, uh, we understand the context here in First Corinthians 14, but Paul is pointing us to God, and he says, you know, God is not the author of confusion. So he's talking about how the church service is running and what people do when you know in the assembly of believers. But he's saying God is not the author of confusion, but he's a God of order. He's a God of peace. as in all the churches of the saints, all the assembly, the gatherings of all believers. So everywhere, in all gatherings of all believers, saints, uh, there's got to be an expression of who God is, that he's not the God of confusion, but he is the God of peace, uh, order and tranquility. He's, he's, he's that kind of a God. So what we must understand is that uh, order, design, organization, things being in proper place is really an expression of who God is. It's an extension of who he is. And uh, that's what Paul is saying, even in the local church, when people gather, there's got to be order because that's an expression of who God is. Right? Now, when we go through the scriptures, uh, we look at some of the old, some of the new. We see time and again the Bible highlighting the importance of organization and uh, administration, delegation, and so on. And I'm just going to, you know, highlight some of these things. In Exodus 18 is a is a classic example. We uh, as many of us are familiar with this, you know, um, and Moses is leading this huge nation of people. And uh, he is, uh, you know, he is sitting there to also care for them. And Jethro, uh, Moses' father-in-law, sees what's happening. You know, uh, uh, could somebody please read for us uh, from Exodus 18? Uh Verses 13 and 14, please. Exodus 18, 
verses 13 and 14. The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge, while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Mm. So you could imagine this, you know, try to picture this in yourself. Moses is sitting there. And, you know, you've got hundreds of people around him who've come to him to solve their problems. Uh, they probably had lots of, you know, maybe different different issues, different things, challenges, problems they're having. And they're all lining up for Moses to solve it. And uh, Moses' father-in-law sees what's happening. And he says in verse 14, what are you doing? Uh, why are you sitting all by yourself from morning till evening to solve these people's problems? And then Moses' father-in-law you know, explains to Moses, advises Moses, saying, Moses, you need to find people that you can appoint as judges or you know, as, delegate this responsibility to them so that they can, you know, take care of all the smaller issues. If there are matters they cannot handle, let them bring that to you. you know? So here's a pretty classic example of somebody advising a leader. Moses is the man of God. He's the prophet of God. But uh, in terms of organization, he was not doing what was right. And he didn't have anything. He was sitting there by himself trying to saw, serve all the people. And so his father-in-law comes and says, Moses, you know, you need to delegate. You need to have more leaders under you. You need to have more people who can help you do this work. So create, you know, what we would, in modern terms, we would say, delegate, have leaders, have a team, have an organizational structure. You know, we would use all these terms today, but that's basically what Jethro is telling Moses. Moses, you have these people and uh, help them do the work for you. Same thing, you know, in, in, in uh, Numbers chapter 11. So if you just quickly look at chapter 11, we're not going to read the whole chapter. Uh, Moses himself reaches a point where he says, you know, um, our Lord, uh, I am not able to lead all these people. Numbers chapter 11, verse 14. Numbers chapter 11 Verse 14. Can somebody read that? I mean, we could read the whole chapter, but I'm just picking out one or two verses. Uh, Numbers 11, verse 14. Can somebody read that? I am not able to bear all these people alone because it is too heavy for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, in this chapter, Numbers 11, if you read the whole, you know, the full chapter, you understand the context. Uh, but the people are crying out to Moses for help once again. And uh, Moses goes to God and says, God, I cannot handle this anymore. That's too much for me. And then in verse later on in that chapter, basically God tells Moses, Moses, I want you to find 70 people, 70 leaders, find, you know, appoint 70 leaders, and I will anoint them and they will help you take care of the people. Okay? So once again, uh, same thing. God is telling Moses, have more people, have an organization, have leaders under you, uh, delegate responsibility, and God will empower those leaders to do their work. Right? And it's very interesting that God is telling Moses, you need to have this. You need to have people. You need to have organization. And, and God says, I will anoint them to help you do the work. And so this is one a great example where uh, that, that speaks to us about the importance of organization, uh, the importance of administration in order to do the work of God. Yeah. Uh, we'll quickly look at some other examples um, uh, in, in Numbers chapter 10. If we just flip back uh, a page, uh, I mean, a chapter in Numbers 10, you know, uh, as, uh, as uh, the people... Uh, again, you know, this if you, we need to read the whole chapter to understand what's happening. But uh, 
you know, we see here in Numbers 10 that as these people are making their journey through the wilderness, God doesn't say, you know, everybody just get up and walk at random. No. God instructs Moses to organize all of them by their tribes around the tabernacle. Right? And they're all organized. They're all well organized around the tabernacle. The north, certain tribes. South, certain tribes. East, certain tribes. West, certain tribes. And then he says, when you're about to move, you blow the trumpet. And then tribe by tribe, you march and you make your journey. It's so very interesting in the book of Numbers and here, especially in uh, chapter 10, he talks about, you know, when the trumpet is blown, uh, people should gather. And uh, then, you know, uh, and then you start out, you go on your journey, tribe by tribe, you make your journey. So again, you know, God is kind of giving his people organization. He's giving his people administration. Says, okay, don't just get up and, you know, everybody walk randomly. No, you're going to move in a very orderly manner, tribe by tribe. Uh, the way you direct them is through the blowing of the trumpets and, uh, you know, and you move in a very orderly manner. So again, you find that in doing something God wants us to do, there is order, there is structure, there is proper administration, so on. Yeah. Uh, quickly, we can make mention of some other examples. There's about worship in the tabernacle. And of course, God told Moses to build the tabernacle. But then he also said, you appoint priests and Levites for various duties in the tabernacle, right? Certain people are designated to do certain tasks. So even in the worship, priests handled certain tasks. Levites handled more of the maintenance type of work in the tabernacle. They would take care of that tabernacle. And uh, same thing when you read about David. During David's time, he had a huge excuse me, a very elaborate, uh, you read about this in First Chronicles 25, a very elaborate system put in place in the tabernacle. Because uh, in David's time, uh, he, uh, David had instituted 24-7 worship going on. So for a period of about 30 years, uh, there was worship going on continuously, nonstop in the tabernacle. But in order to do something like that, he had about 8,000 people working uh, in the tabernacle. There were, there were huge teams of worshipers, musicians, singers. There were huge teams of people to do the work, physical work uh, around the tabernacle. Uh, so those are like a, you know, a big group. If you read, read the details, you'll find there's about 8,000 people. And they were all highly organized. They were all given, you know, one-hour slots. Uh, the, the singers and the musicians they were given one-hour slots in which they would come. They would do their part, uh, and so uh, this was a spiritual work, which was worship to God. But if you look at the details, it was extremely highly organized and well administered. So in order to do the spiritual work, there was huge organization involved and good administration involved, right? And similarly, uh, just one more example from the Old Testament is the book of Nehemiah. In the entire book, you read uh, how Nehemiah went about rebuilding the walls of the city of Jerusalem, but given him a vision to fulfill that. But then when he went in there, he got various people involved, you know, different people, and he organized them around the wall and, the, and gave them different parts of the wall to build. And they were all organized while that, so that while some were working, others were protecting them. They were looking out for uh, those who are doing the work. So another example of, uh, you know, proper organization and administration. Nehemiah was carrying out a vision God had put in his heart. But in order to do that, he got 
people involved. He got different kinds of people involved and he got them all very well organized so that the work could take place. So just some examples in the Bible where we are seeing the work of God being done, but through good organization and administration. Now, of course, when you come into the New Testament, something that you and I are very familiar with, uh, we see in the evolution of the local church, uh, the church that began in Jerusalem, very soon it comes to a place where the church needed dedicated people to handle administrative tasks. So in Acts chapter 6, when they, you know, they, they had to serve food for the people, uh, the apostles said, you know, we need seven men whom we are going to appoint over this business. So let's go there to Acts 6. Maybe we'll just look at uh, there in Acts 6. And we could uh, read that. So Acts, uh, okay, verse 3, please. Acts 6, we'll just read verse 3. Somebody could read that for us. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Mm. So the apostles realized that while they were focused on prayer and the ministry of the word, the spiritual side, they needed people uh, who would come alongside them and take care of the business of the church. In this case, it had to do with uh, serving food to all the people who were there. So they said, you know, get seven men. But these seven men had to, you know, they had to be of good reputation, they had to have a good report, they had before the Holy Spirit and wisdom. They needed, they needed certain criteria here in order to do the simple thing of serving food to the people. And uh, later on, as we progress in the, in the growth of the church, you come to 1 Timothy 3, there it's very clearly identified. You know, Paul talks about bishops, he talks about deacons. Bishops basically are spiritual elders, those who are involved in the spiritual side of the ministry. But he also mentions deacons, those who are handling the administration, the organization of the church, the, the practical side of things. So he's saying, you know, the church needs both. You need elders, you need deacons, you need people who will handle the affairs of the church, the work of the church. And in Romans 16, you know, Paul is uh, referring to uh, a, a lady who is handling the work. So let's just go to Romans 16. It's interesting to read. Let's read verses 1 and 2, please. Romans 16, verses 1 and 2. I command to you, Fope, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Kansira, that you have received her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in whatever business that she has need of you, for indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Mm -hmm. So, Paul is... Uh, recognizing and recommending uh, Phoebe. But what is Phoebe's work? It is, you know, what we would say today, we call it administrative type of work. You know, she is, uh, uh, she is handling uh, certain things. Uh, you know, he refers to as a business of the church, but she is a helper. She's an assistant. She is serving the people with what she's doing, right? So, and Paul is commending her. He's recommending her. And he's saying, you know, uh, she's a big blessing to others as well as to himself. So uh, we see in the life of the church itself that there are people who are involved in spiritual ministry, but there are also people who are handling the organization, the administration, the practical things that need to be done 
in the life of the church. Another thing that we do understand here in um, in uh, in the church as a body is that there are gifts and ministries in the church that are specific to uh, helps and administrations. Right. So um, first of all, the church is a body. That means uh, it's a system. So when you look at a body, let me just uh, stop sharing and just look at the screen for a bit. Okay. So when we uh, when we look at the human body, right? The the body at the lowest level, let's say we start up with a cell, but cells are grouped together to form various tissues and organs. And organs are specialized in their function. And then several organs work together. Now we have systems and processes in the body. Actually, we have your skeletal system, respiratory system, the vascular system, and different things that happen in the human body. But it all starts off, the cells are grouped together. And they form, eventually form organs, which are specialized. So even, so the, the church is compared to a body. So therefore, the church also should function. If the church wants to function, it should have this kind of specialization. It should have this systems. It should have processes for the proper functioning of the spiritual body, the body which is the church. And what we also find is that in the church, God has placed certain gifts that he has given to people, which are very administrative in nature. Right? So if you look at Romans 12, Romans 12, um, and then we, we are looking at verses 6 to 8. In Romans 12, verse 6 to 8, and I'll just mention this. He says there in verse 7, he uses the word ministry. Ministry is any kind of service, right? So even if somebody's serving as an usher, as a deacon, in accounting, in uh, you know doing something, like in promoting, in promotions, in media, they are doing service. So that's included here in, in this word ministry. This is just in verse 7. And then... In verse 8, he talks about those who lead, those who lead. So you could lead anything. You could lead a group of people. Uh, you could lead uh, a certain area of ministry. Uh, so that leadership ability, wherever it is and how it is expressed, is a gift and a function in the body. Right? So leadership. So we see here that service, ministry, or leadership are gifts given in the body, and they need to be put to use. Same thing, and I just want to po point out here in 1 Corinthians 12, and I think this is important. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and let's read verse 28. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Could somebody read that for us, please? And God set some of some in the church First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps governments, yeah. diversity of tongues. Okay. So, notice in verse 28 what Paul is saying. He's saying, God has appointed. So this is not man appointing, but God appointing. It means God has put this in the church. And of course, he mentions in apostles and prophets and teachers and miracles and gifts of healings. But then what he says, he mentions helps administrations. So this is where, you know, it's slightly different from what an apostle does or a teacher does or a prophet does. It helps, meaning any kind of service, assisting, you know, somebody assists in media, somebody assists in you know, technology, somebody assists in any other way, ass helps. And administrations, 
And he says, God has appointed these. So in the church, there are people whom God has put to serve in this capacity as helping in the ministry, as administering. The word administering, the administrations, um, uh, is, is interesting. It's talking about somebody who um, navigates the ship. You know, like the you know the person who is in charge of making sure where the ship is going. You know, so there is there are people who help with that kind of work. Of course, you have people who are apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists, and they are doing their work. But you also have people appointed by God who do helps and administrations. God has given them that grace and given them that. Uh, familiar with is that when Paul he writes to the churches and we read that verse first Corinthians 14 33 but you also find this in other places where Paul says you know the church there has to be order in the church the way the church functions there has to be order so what we have done right now is we've just kind of scanned through the Old Testament scanned through the New Testament we've seen that uh, in the functioning of ministry, in the functioning of what God wants done, there has to be organization, administration, order, and that it is part of what God wants among his people. It's not foreign to us. It's not, you know, just for people who are in the or in secular, what we refer to as secular organizations, but it is there, part of ministry, or part of what God wants to do. Uh, let me just continue to share my share the document with you and just speak from that. Okay, I'm just sharing this word document, you know. Um, so let's talk about the practical side. You know, we just we looked at it from a biblical side, the importance of uh, good organization administration. But let's talk about the practical side. From a practical side, you know. There is a need or there's an expectation from people today that the church must be organized and efficient. You know, that means if you're a pastor, the congregation expects things to work well with the church, you know, from an administrative and organization perspective. For example, if somebody wants a letter from the church, uh, they need to get it in a timely way. Uh, if somebody needs, uh, you know, there are a lot of administrative things that they need help with, maybe a letter for school admission, a letter for, you know, uh, various things for marriage and, you know, so on. Uh, they expect the church to be organized, to be efficient and to provide that kind of service or even in a service. When they come into a service, a, a church service, they expect things to happen properly, you know, or, in a church event, uh, there is expectation from people that the event should be organized efficiently uh, and so on. So well, we cannot say, you know, you know, we cannot avoid that. We have to pro you know, be organized, be efficient. Secondly, what from a practical side, when you look at it, uh, people are eager to serve with their skills. They're willing to volunteer. Right. So um, um, in, in, in most churches, uh, people want to contribute in some way and they feel that, look, you know, I have certain skills. These skills may not be that of preaching and teaching and, uh, you know, what we call a spiritual ministry. Uh, these skills may be in something that's more of administrative in nature that may be more like helping. But I want to serve. I'm, I want to volunteer. Uh, and I want to contribute towards the life of the church. And so people are eager. And so we need to, you know, uh, give them the opportunity and welcome that. And thirdly, the world in which we live requires that because the world is changing. The world around us is changing. Uh, the way people 
live life and they go about life. They're using technology more and more. Uh, the way they interact with people is changing. Uh, so the world also, you know, if we are going to reach people outside the church, uh, we need to be able to reach them in ways in which uh, that are relevant to them. And so the church needs to, you know, uh, upgrade itself in terms of the use of technology or other things that help will help it reach and help it be relevant to those outside the church. So from a practical perspective, organization, administration becomes a necessity. It's no longer, you know, just now. So let's close off this first lecture by just looking at what are some excuses, you know, that people in churches, ministries uh, make uh, for poor organization? How would we respond to that? Right? Uh, I mean, I'm just putting this out there so we can think about it, right? So one, sometimes people, you know, especially if a pastor or a, a spiritual leader, uh, they would excuse saying, look, you know, uh, we don't have proper training. You know, we, I went to seminary, I went to Bible college, and they only talked to us, all us about the Bible, about how to, you know, interpret scripture or preach scripture, but we were not trained to run an organization. We were not trained to lead. Uh, uh, and we, don't, we were not trained to handle technology. We were not trained to, you know, do these things. So sometimes that becomes an excuse that pastors give, you know, okay, we were only trained to preach the Bible, uh, teach the Bible, but we were not trained to organize a church. Uh, we were not trained to run a accounting department or oversee an accounting department and so on. So that lack of proper training becomes an excuse that uh, Christian leaders could make. Um, of course, our response will be, well, you can have other people. I mean, one is you can learn some of these skills. Secondly, you could have people who have the skills, you know, to come and help. So connected to that, another excuse, you know, leaders make is, oh, we don't have skilled people, you know. Um, we don't have the means to hire skilled staff. And if you want somebody, uh, you have to pay for them. We don't have the means to pay for them. So therefore, uh, the church is lacking in the organization or administration in that area. But, you know, I think the response to that is, look, there are lots of volunteers. There are people who are willing to volunteer in that area. And so if you announce that you want volunteers, uh, there may be some people who can help in some of these areas. Or eventually people will come and they will, you know, uh, help. And it's a good way to help people be a part of the church because they feel that they can even contribute to the church through the skills they have. A third excuse sometimes people make, you know, they say, look, uh, only, you know, uh, those who have been trained in spiritual matters must be involved in the life of the church. Uh, you know, the, you, how can you have people who have, uh, quote unquote, uh, skills that are not spiritual be involved in the life of the church but that's where we can point them to the scripture and say look the scriptures say that there are people whom god has appointed who serve and helps and administrations so it's not just people who are doing you know apostolic prophetic pastoral type of work but even those who are doing helps and administrations god has appointed them and they can come along and be part of what's happening in the life of the church a fourth excuse that we may run into is, you know, people say, well, uh, we want to focus on spiritual things. Uh, we are a spiritual ministry. Let's not uh, get distracted into doing oh, organization, administration, and so on. Right? But then in response to that, we have to help them see the value of good organization and administration, that actually if you have good organization and good administration, it can make the spiritual ministry even more effective. It can help the spiritual ministry reach further and wider when you have good organization and good administration. Just two more things we'll look before we close here is, um, you know, sometimes we say, people say, oh, look, look, we don't want to become 
we want to have a spiritual atmosphere. We don't want to become corporate like, uh, because when you have an organization, when you have administration, then you, you know, you need to have a lot of policies and processes and so on. We, then it becomes like a corporate. It's no longer spiritual atmosphere. Then that's where we need to look to God and say, look, God himself is a God of order. He's a God of organization. So uh, having organization, having a structure, having formal procedures is not unlike God, but God himself is a God of order and uh, organization. Lastly, um, some people say, well, this is God's work. You know, he doesn't need our help. He'll just get it done. You know, uh, why should we set up an organization? Why should we, uh, you know, do all these kinds of things? This is God's work. He'll do it. It is true it's God's work, but he works through people. He works through organizational structures. And you have a great examples in the Bible. You know, God told Moses, appoint 70 leaders. You know, and God put it in Nehemiah's heart, you know, how he should organize so that the walls could be rebuilt. So it is God's work, but he's working through people and he works through, you know, the organization, the administration we do. They become channels of God's work um, in us and through us to help others. Okay. Um, so I have uh, kind of shared uh, on the importance of organization and administration. I just want to see if you have any questions, comments, thoughts uh, before we close. Anybody, you want to say anything, you want to ask anything, any comments? Okay. So, we will kind of, I think we should have more discussion. I see the comments on the chat, uh, but uh, we will, you know, engage in a little bit more discussion as we go along. Uh, I think I did uh, all the talking today. I didn't give you a chance to interact, uh, but we will do that uh, next time. Okay. All right. Thank you for listening patiently. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, you know, wrap up. Let's close in prayer. And we will pick this up next week. And uh, sorry, do we have another class on this? Uh, yeah, later this week on Friday, we'll pick this up and take it forward. Okay. Could somebody please close in prayer? We will dismiss. Sharon, you want to close in prayer? Yes, Pastor. Thank you, Jesus, for this wonderful time to pray. Jesus, I thank you for you, for our pastor, for our APC ministry, for our Bible college, Father. Uh, whatever, whatever, we, whatever we are learning, Father, that we are in our ministry, of God, in your ministry, of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading us. Thank you, thank you, God, that you are in, in our class, of God. Thank you for your presence in our class, of God. Father, I pray. That bless, uh, bless us, O oh Lord, bless our ministry, O God, who are in ministry, O God, Father, and praying, O God, that bless our class, and Father, I'm praying that uh, what we, whatever we are learning, O God, that should be used in our ministry, Father, and thanking and submitting this class in, into your hand, O God. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, uh, see you Friday. God bless you. See you again soon. Bye.